uh, to New Day. Okay, last week we began a new preaching series uh, entitled Hidden Figures in the Easter Story. What we're doing over these few weeks are looking at some of the the lesser known characters uh, in the Easter story and looking at some of the roles that they played in the passion narrative. Judas Iscariot, Simon of Cyrene, Barabbas, Pilate, Mary Magdalene. Uh, We're going to be looking at these people, each one over the coming weeks. Last week, we looked at Judas Iscariot. uh, And today, we're going to be looking at Simon of Cyrene. So just to kind of set the scene uh, before we read one verse, because that's what we're going to be reading and looking at today, one verse. Uh, But before we do that, let me just set the scene for a moment. So uh, Jesus has been sentenced by Pilate to death. And I want you just to imagine the scene. The crowds in Jerusalem are, are 10 deep. And they are taunting Jesus. Jesus bears the weight of his cross, and he is taunted by the mob. People are jostling to see him. They're jostling to spit at him. They're jostling to shout their abuse at him, to throw things at him. This is the same crowd, remember, that only a few days earlier had cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the same crowd that had waved palm branches, that had taken off their coats and laid them on the floor as Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. Now, the same crowd were despising and rejecting Jesus as it was prophesied in Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Now, mixed into the crowd, there was Jesus' mom, there was John, there was Mary Magdalene and a few other disciples. And as Jesus staggered under the weight of the cross, bruised, battered, and exhausted, a man called Simon from Cyrene was seized by a Roman soldier and made to carry the cross of Christ. This is important. He didn't volunteer. Didn't volunteer. He was compelled, it says in Matthew and Mark's gospel, compelled to carry the cross. That means he was kind of seized, grabbed by the scruff of his neck with a spear up him, and taken to come and carry the cross. And he was carried this cross this blood-spattered, heavy piece of wood all the way up to Calvary. We're going to read one verse today. We're going to read Luke 23 and verse 26. As the soldiers led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. And they put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. Just stop for a minute. That one verse we've just read is quite extraordinary. Because Jesus, remember, is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is the creator of the universe. He's the one in Psalm 55 and verse 2 who says, Jesus carries our burdens. And yet here in this verse, he needs help from another man, from another human being. I mean, think about what happened to Jesus over the last 12, 24 hours. He'd been up all night. He'd been to the mockery of a trial before Pilate. He'd been to various kangaroo court sessions uh, that the Jews had held. He'd been whipped so that pieces of flesh were were flapping off his back. He'd been mocked, he'd been beaten, he'd been hit by soldiers. He had a crown of thorns on his head. Jesus was a disfigured state of a man, and it's no wonder that he needed help. And the man who was chosen was Simon of Cyrene. Now, we know that Simon of Cyrene was a historical figure. 
He was well known in the early church. In Mark's account of that one verse, Mark 15 and verse 21, the account of Simon being seized from the crowd to take on the cross, it says that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. In other words, he was known to the early church. This was a historical, well-known man in the life of the early church. Cyrene is modern-day Libya in northern Africa. And as I mentioned, and we'll touch on again in a minute, he was, Simon of Cyrene, a very significant figure in the early church. Okay, what we're going to do, using that one verse this morning, is we're going to look at five things we can learn from the man who carried the cross of Christ. Five things. Number one, God uses people of every tribe, tongue, and color. Cyrene is in modern-day Libya in Africa. Now, scholars have various opinions. Some scholars think that there was a number of Jewish settlers who had lived in Cyrene and then come to Jerusalem for the Passover. But most scholars agree that Simon of Cyrene was almost certainly a black man. A black man carried the cross of Christ. A foreigner served Jesus in his final hours. A black man, Simon of Cyrene, had the greatest honor of carrying the cross of the Savior of the world. I think it's so important to state that because the narrative for centuries was that Jesus is a white man. But the truth is, Jesus was a brown-skinned Messiah, and it was a black man who carried the cross of Christ up the hill to Golgotha. And I think as Christians and as the church, it's so important that we preach and that we share that Jesus is for all people every tribe and tongue and nation. In Christ Jesus, we are all equal. That's what it says in Galatians, there's no Jew or Gentile. There's no rich or poor. There's no black or white. We are one new man in Christ Jesus. Now, those of you who may have had an eye on the news this week will know that there was an absolutely abhorrent, evil, racist ordeal that child Q had at the hands of the Metropolitan Police in Hackney. And I think when we hear those things, it's important to say that Jesus loves the nations. Jesus came for all people. When Pentecost fell in Acts chapter 2, when it fell upon all all those people gathered in Jerusalem, the nations were there in Jerusalem. Many of the first believers were black, were from Africa. In Acts chapter 8, you had the Ethiopian eunuch who is, who is saved and baptized by Philip and then goes out and starts to plant churches. And the saint, the Ethiopian saint, in Acts 13, when, when this turning point in the life of the early church, when the early church is sent out, you have there very clearly Simeon, a black man, was one of those key individuals that was sent out to plant churches. Simon of Cyrene shows us that God loves the nations. God loves black, brown, and white. God is not a white man. God uses all tribes and tongues and races. That's the first thing we can learn, that the man carrying the cross teaches us. The second thing is that it's a picture of discipleship. It's a picture. That verse is a picture of discipleship. It's very interesting. In that verse, Luke is the only one who says this. Matthew and Mark put it differently. But Luke clearly says that Simon carries the cross behind Jesus. It's as if Luke wants us to remember the verse that he said in Luke 9 and verse 23, that as believers, we are to come after Jesus and follow him. It's a, it's a visual picture of discipleship. And I think it's important to say that it's, it's not easy to follow Jesus. It's not. Simon 
had taunts. He was hit. He was battered. He was knocked around. And that's what the world does to us. The world knocks us, batters us, calls us names and taunts us. And following Jesus is not follow Jesus and everything will be easy. No, no. Following Jesus is you are never alone. Following Jesus is Jesus understands. Following Jesus is Jesus walks with you through every up and every down. Someone said this, which I think is so helpful about discipleship. Jesus came not to improve your life. He came to be your life. And out of Jesus' 12 disciples, 10, 10 of Jesus' 12 disciples were martyred for their faith. Judas, as we looked at last week, hung himself, and John died of old age on the Isle of Patmos. But the other 10 were martyred for their faith. I think that that snapshot of Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross behind Jesus is a beautiful kind of picture of discipleship. It shows us what true discipleship actually looks like. Third thing that we can learn from the man who carried the cross of Christ. We don't choose suffering. We don't choose struggle. This is important. You see, Simon of Cyrene did not expect to carry the cross. That day he went into Jerusalem. He didn't think, oh, today I'm going to go and carry the cross of Jesus Christ. No, no, no. He didn't think that. He didn't know that that was coming. Many of us have unexpected encounters with suffering and struggle. It's not choice. It's not preference. It's not even the result of our sinful actions. But suffering and struggle just sometimes seem to find us. Did you notice what it said in the verse? It said that he was coming in from the country. Coming in from the country into Jerusalem. And then he was hit by this random, unplanned action of carrying the cross of Christ. He was snatched from the crowd and made to carry the cross. Some of you, let's be really honest, candid here. Some of you, over the last month or even the last year or the last week, things ticking along nicely. Things going really well. Jobs, fine. Family, they're pretty okay. Friends, all good. Bank balance is okay. Then suddenly, wham, without warning, a curveball hits you. A family issue blows up without any warning. A financial curveball hits you without any warning. A health issue comes, a letter from the doctor or or, or a phone call to go into the surgery. It's not by choice. It's not your, your fault. But suddenly, some struggle, some suffering hits you. It's vital to know, you see, that as Christians, we face these things as much as anyone else. We're not immune to struggle and suffering just because we're believers. We battle, the Bible says, the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's not your fault, the hardships that you are going through. It's, it's the world that we live in and that sometimes we can get caught uh, from nowhere by a struggle and suffering that hits us. Just one scripture that I want to read in relation to this. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, just brings me so much comfort when suffering hits, when struggle hits, when, when challenge hits. Hebrews 4, verses 15 to 16. This is talking about Jesus. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted, has faced trials, has faced struggles, yet was without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus understands. Jesus has been there. Jesus is in, our, in, the, in with us in that struggle. 
But struggle comes. Suffering comes. We don't choose it, but it happens. Fourth thing that Simon of Cyrene uh, shows us is the impact of our lives. The legacy of Simon of Cyrene is quite incredible. Your life influences others. It especially influences those that are closest to you. It influences your family. And then those that you spend the most time with. In Mark's account of Simon of Cyrene, in Mark 15 and verse 21, as I already mentioned, it mentions there, Mark mentions that Simon was the the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, now Mark would have only included those two names, Alexander and Rufus, if people recognized who they were. This is a deliberate recording by Mark of these two sons of Simon of Cyrene. Now, Mark wrote his gospel to Christians in Rome. If you flick to the end, last chapter of Romans, chapter 16 and verse 13, you will see there that Rufus is mentioned as one of the key people in the early church. Scholars will tell you that is the same Rufus. That the son of Simon of Cyrene is, is the Rufus that is mentioned in Romans 16 and verse 13. You see, what's happened here? Simon's life has been transformed by Jesus, and then he leaves a legacy that is ongoing. Simon had to carry the cross of Christ. He then would have seen Jesus crucified. He then would have been around for the resurrection. He became a follower of Christ at Pentecost. It tells us in Acts 2 verse 10 that there was followers from Cyrene. So if Simon was there, the Holy Spirit fell upon him. And then Simon became a significant part of the early church. So significant that his son Rufus was part of the church in Rome. You see, Simon's life left a huge impact on his sons. The greatest legacy you could argue that Simon's life had was his sons, Rufus and Alexander. If you're a parent here today, if you're a parent, the greatest legacy that you will leave is your children. Pray for your kids if you are a parent. Be real about your faith. Talk about your faith during the week, at the dinner table, over breakfast, when tough trials come, when prayers are answered. Talk about faith during the week, not just on a Sunday. We go to church in a little box. No, no, no. Talk about it throughout the week. Be seen to read your Bible. Be seen when you're in the house to read your Bible, even if it's just for two minutes. Even if it's not for very long, be seen to read your physical Bible or or show the app on your phone that you are looking at and reading. And let me just say this. It's never too late to start to do these things. If you're you're a parent and you say, I don't do that. It's not something I've done. It's all a bit separate. It's all a bit, you're over there and I'm over here. This is my faith. And, you know, it's never too late to start, to start, to start leaving your Bible open on the kitchen table, to start praying before your meal, to start praying for for difficulties at school or things that people are going through. It's it's never too late. And some of you say, well, I'm not a parent, but but many of you will be in the future. And it's something to think about that the greatest impact and legacy that you will leave will be on your children. And if you're not a physical parent, maybe your kids have left home or, or maybe You know, that you haven't got kids. That's not something that's in your life. That's absolutely fine. But you know what? You can be a spiritual mom and dad to those around you. You can leave a legacy to those that you come into contact with. In the life of the church, you could be a spiritual mother and father to the young people. To young people who maybe don't have a mom or dad who are in church. So you can be their spiritual mom and dad, leaving a legacy in their life, praying for them talking to them, investing in them, encouraging them. Or maybe it's not young people, but maybe you can be a spiritual mom and dad to another couple, to another young couple who've just got married or another young couple who are going through difficult times. You can 
leave a legacy by, by pouring what you have learned and what you have known over the years into another couple. Or, or maybe, you know, you, you've been single as a Christian for many, many years and God has used you powerfully and you've worked through a number of things. Well, then you can sow that and leave a legacy in others who are maybe single and not married yet or not going to get married. But you can say, I'm going to leave a legacy by sowing my life into those around me. You see, the biggest legacy that we leave will not be a bank balance or a house that we give to our children or a house that we leave in the name of X charity or whatever. The biggest legacy that we lead will be our impact on others' lives. That's the biggest legacy we will leave. And so then I think we should think intentionally, how am I going to leave my legacy on those closest and those around me and those in the church and those that God has led me to? Something important to think about because look at Simon of Cyrene and look at the impact that his life had on his sons and his sons being part of the early church and the legacy that his life reveals. Final thing, final thing, that the man who carried Jesus' cross can show us. God is at work in the detail. I wonder if you've thought, thought this through. Why did they grab Simon from the crowd to carry the cross? Why didn't they just let Jesus just, just stutter and, and, and fall and and then they kick him some more and pick him up and kick him. And why did they get Simon to help Jesus? I mean, the Romans aren't known for being kind. What, what, why? Was it an act of kindness? Was it an act of cruelty to get some foreigner from the crowd and get them to carry the cross? Or was it just simply to get the job done? Was it to make sure that Jesus got to the cross. Think about it from the point of view of the Roman soldiers. You see, the Roman soldiers had a job to do. Their job was on the orders of Pilate to get Jesus to Golgotha and to get him crucified. That was their role. They had a job to do. They didn't want Jesus to die along the way because of exhaustion. That would be to fail on behalf of the soldiers. They wouldn't have done their job properly if Jesus had collapsed and died of a heart attack or something on the road up to Golgotha. They, they wanted him to survive the torture so that he got to the cross. If you go back a little bit to the previous night to Gethsemane, in Gethsemane, we're told that Jesus was so anxious about what was before him that he sweated blood. And medically, that, that's a condition that actually can happen. If you're so anxious about something, you can actually sweat blood because of your anxiety. But Luke's gospel, and it's the only one, Luke's gospel tells us that Jesus was helped by an angel to work through his anxiety. In other words, in this great moment of anxiety, in, in, in Jesus imagining the horror of what was to come, of the death, of the pain, of the separation from the Father, in order for Jesus to go through with the plan, God sent an angel to help him so that he could gather his strength and keep going to the cross. Here, here we have a human. Simon of Cyrene, who helped Jesus get to the cross when humanly he was weak. Jesus needed help. And Simon was that help sent from God. You see, God's plan was that Jesus died upon the cross. God's plan was that the spear would go into the side of Jesus Christ and the blood and water would separate because not a bone of his body had been broken. 
these prophecies, this plan, the foretelling had to happen. In order for that to happen, Simon was part of the detail to make it happen. Okay, Simon was needed as the little piece of the jigsaw to link everything that had gone before with what was about to happen on the cross when Jesus defeated the forces of evil. God is at work in the detail. He's at work. His plans and his purposes will prevail. God uses individuals like you and me to bring about his works and his purposes. Sometimes we won't even know what's going on. We'll be just on our way on a day like Simon was on his way from the country and then be used powerfully in God's plan. Be used powerfully as a detail in God's sovereign plan. God uses us. God uses you and me. God is at work in the detail. He uses ordinary people like you and like me. Okay, Simon of Cyrene, the man who carried Jesus' cross. One verse from Scripture, but five things for us to be challenged about. God uses people of every tribe and tongue and color. Simon carrying the cross behind Jesus is a picture of discipleship. We don't choose suffering and struggle. It sometimes hits us without warning, like it hit Simon that day. Simon of Cyrene, the impact of his life, the legacy on his sons and on the early church. What is our legacy that we're going to leave on on, on the lives that we have influence on? And finally, the, the, the wonderful comfort and the wonderful truth that God is at work in the detail. His plans, his purposes will succeed. He is at work. An angel in the Garden of Gethsemane to get Jesus through the anxiety a human being, a man on the street in Jerusalem to get Jesus to the cross to be crucified and to defeat the powers of evil. Emily and Adam, if you could come up. What we're going to do is this. I'm going to say a prayer and then we're going to sing a song which fits really well to what we've just been listening to. As we've worshipped and sung that together, I'm then going to come back, and I believe I've got a couple of words, prophetic words for us as a church, as individuals, off the back of this preach, off the back of the message that we've heard. So I'm going to pray, then we're going to worship, and then I want us just to be open before we close to God just highlighting a few things that are speaking into our lives. Let's stand, let's stand. Father God, thank you for this wonderful reminder from the Easter story. That Jesus, you went to the cross and you died for us. You died in our place. You dealt with our sin once and for all. I want to pray, Lord Jesus, as we just sing this next song together. I want to pray, Father, that this would be a moment that is like a recommitment to follow you, to follow you, to carry our cross, to pick up our cross and follow you. There's a cost to discipleship. There's a cost to following Jesus. It's not always easy. But I pray as we just sing this song through, as we use the words and as we think before God, would this be a moment where we recommit ourselves to being disciples of Jesus, to following Jesus, the one